It's now 7.30, so I call the Stanton City Council regular meeting to order for June 10th, 2021. All right, so the first item, I would just like to let folks know that you uh, no longer have to wear your mask. However, if you choose to do so, you can. Um, we ask if you've not been vaccinated to please wear your mask. We're not going to ask you if you've been vaccinated or not, um, but that's totally your choice if you have been vaccinated. We have um, hand sanitizer stations outside the entrance to the chambers. Uh, we also have sanitizing wipes at the podium if you care to use them. All right, and uh, the council members, um, just like before, if, if you would like to be recognized, please recognize the mayor and I will um, recognize you so you can um, ask your questions or make your comments. I would like to take this moment to welcome Rachel Zinni. She is our new clerk of council. Yay. I would like to say thank you to Morgan Smith for serving as our interim Absolutely. clerk of council. And you can stay on, uh, Morgan, right. right there for every meeting here from here on out, if you'd like. like She's already got one foot out the door. I see that <laughs> one foot out the door. You're right. All right. So the next item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. If you would like to say the pledge, please stand. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, the next item is the invocation, moment of silence, and tonight it's Vice Mayor Robertson's turn. Okay, I will be uh, reading our Christian prayer, so um, if any of those would like to participate, may you please bow your head. Dear wise and loving Father, First, let me say thank you on behalf of all who are gathered here today. Thank you for your many and abundant blessings. Thank you for life itself, for the measure of health we need to fulfill our callings, for sustenance, and for friendship. Thank you for the ability to be involved in useful work and for the honor of bearing appropriate responsibilities. Thanks as well for the freedom to embrace you or the freedom to reject you. Thank you for loving us even so from your boundless and gracious nature. In the scriptures, you have said that citizens ought to obey the governing authorities since you have established those very authorities to promote, pro, excuse me, to promote peace and order and justice. Therefore, I pray for our mayor for the various levels of city officials, and in particular, for this assembled council. I am asking that you would graciously grant them wisdom to govern amid the conflicting interests and issues of our time, a sense of the welfare and true needs of our people, a keen thirst for justice and rightness, confidence in what is good and fitting, the ability to work together in harmony, even when there is honest disagreement, personal peace in their lives and joy in their task. I pray for the agenda set before us today. Please give an assurance of what would please you and what would benefit those who live and work in and around our beloved city of Stanton. It is in your most blessed name, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Next is the mayor's report. So this past Saturday, I had the honor of being able to throw out the first pitch for the Stanton Braves. Um, my ball went a little to the right. I called it a curveball. <laughs> <laughs> That was quite an honor and a lot of fun. So um, the only one I could get to help me with practice pitching the ball was my dog. So, 
uh, I had the honor of welcoming citizens from all over to a luncheon that was given by the Colonel Thomas Huger chapter DAR. This was out at the uh, Frontier Cultural Museum and it was a luncheon to honor our Vietnam War vets. And I'd like to take a moment to recognize our Vietnam War vets in the room today. Are there any um, Vietnam War vets? If you can please stand. Only if you can, Baldwin. <laughs> Their focus was on the fact that a lot of our uh, Vietnam vets came home to booze rather than cheers. And we uh, want to make sure that every vet knows that they are appreciated and we certainly um, recognize their sacrifice. All right, let's see. Speaking of baseball, I was asked to. Um, advise that the Woodrow Wilson Presidential Library will have Woodrow Wilson himself throwing out the first pitch of the Stanton Braves game on Friday, tomorrow, June 11th. This will be at 7 p.m. at John Moxie Memorial Stadium, which is located in Gypsy Hill Park, which I'm sure everybody knows. So if you wanna watch Woodrow Wilson throw out a pitch, I don't know if his dog helped him or not, but um, we'll see if his curveball is as good as mine. So. He's coming in the pure Cerro as well. Oh, wow. yes, he is. He's uh, going to be arriving in his 1919 Pierce Arrow presidential limousine. Wow, that's exciting. So that should make for a lot of fun. Um, I'd also like to mention the fifth annual Shenandoah Valley Juneteenth celebration. This will be on June 19th at 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And this will be at the Frontier Cultural Museum. So you do not need tickets. You can just show up. That's my understanding. Um, so that should be a fun event. And this has been um, going on for five years now. So let's certainly support that event as well. Um, I'd like to take a moment to let the family of um, Tyler Zombro know that we are praying for them as and we continue to pray for the uh, speedy recovery of Tyler Zombro. Um, Tyler graduated from um, what was then Lehigh, now Stanton High School, as a baseball player. And he played for the Stanton Braves. And then he went on to play for Counselor Claffey, help me out here. Mm, played some college ball. <laughs> Dur Durham, was it Durham Bulls? He was playing for the Durham, Durham Bulls last week. Yeah, yes. played at George Mason. And George, George Mason and then Durham Bulls. Took a line drive to the head. Yeah, so he's in the hospital trying to recover. Um, so many prayers go out to one of our Stantonians that is um, trying to recover from a very uh, deadly hit. However, it sounds like he's going to have... Um, a successful recovery. Eric, he was released. He's home now. Oh, he is. Oh, recovery. thank you. Yes. Oh, wonderful. That's great news. Love to hear it. All right. Well, we'll continue to pray for him and his family. If I'm not mistaken, he was just recently married just a few months ago as well. So, all right. Are there any additional items by members of council? Madam Mayor. Councilor Claffey. Uh, the nominating committee uh, met on June 10th. No, we met on June 4th, and uh, we're presenting the report tonight, the June 10th. I would, uh, we're going to list all these as a motion uh, to appoint the following people. For the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee to appoint Manita Deaton to replace the unexpired term of Benjamin Brewer beginning 20, July 1, 2021 and expiring January 31st, 2022. To the Blue Ridge Community College Board to appoint Janet Ewing for a four-year term beginning July 1, 2021 and expiring June 30th, 2025. For the Landscape Advisory Board to appoint Marnie Sheets for a three-year term beginning July 1st, 2021 and expiring on June 30th, 2024. For the Lewis Creek Watershed Advisory Committee to appoint Jim Kivligan and Nicholas Palacio for three-year terms beginning July 1, 2021 and expiring June 30th, 2024. 
for the Valley Community Services Board to appoint Ross Parker for a three-year term beginning July 1, 2021 and expiring June 30th, 2024. For the Shenandoah Valley Partnership to appoint Amanda DeMeo for a two-year term beginning July 1, 2021 and expiring June 30th, 2023. Also, the following reappointments came about. Captain Brian Brown, Dan Wright, and Trafford McRae to the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee for two-year terms beginning July, 20, July 1, 2021 and expiring June 30th, 2023. Sharon Angle to the Central Shenandoah Planning Com District Commission for a three-year term beginning July 1, 2021 and expiring June 30th, 2024. Carter Lively to the Historic Preservation Commission for a three-year term beginning July 1, 2021 and expiring June 30th, 2024. Zachary Long to the Joint IDA of the County of Stafford and the City of Stanton for a four-year term beginning July 1, 2021 and expiring June 30th, 2025. Matthew Schreckheis to the Landscape Advisory Board for a three-year term beginning July 1, 2021 and expiring June 30th, 2024. Tom Yago and Doug Wolf to the Lewis Creek Watershed Advisory Committee for three-year terms beginning July 1, 2021 and expiring June 30th, 2024. And Bruce Rupert to the Recreation Advisory Committee for another three-year term beginning July 1, 2021 and expiring June 30th, 2024. That'll be his seventh term. Sounds like the nominating committee has been busy. All Absolutely. Right. <laughs> so there's a nomination coming out from the nominations committee. So we do not need a second. Is there any further discussion? Councilor Darby? Councilman Clavier, did you say June 1st or June 4th? We met on June 1st. I may have misheard you, but I thought you said June 4th. June 1st. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Alrighty. Uh, Ms. Zinni, please call the roll. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, are there any additional items by um, Councillor Mead? Um, yes, on Saturday I participated in the Clean the Bay Day efforts, uh, joined with members of the Friends of the Middle River in the Lewis Creek uh, watershed near VSDB. Uh, good news to report, uh, we um, found very few plastic straws. So I think the public awareness of the issue of straws and how damaging they are uh, to our waters has been taken seriously. On the bad news side, a lot of uh, grocery bags in smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. I mean, there were, there were pieces this small and there were strip bags, but uh, it, it's an issue we're going to have to address because uh, those bags begin to break apart. Those particles do not get absorbed into um, uh, they don't deteriorate, they just get smaller and smaller and they end up in the ocean and they end up in the flesh of the fish we eat. Uh, so we've got, that's, a, that's, a, that's an issue we need to address as a world, as a country, as a city. Um, and so I hope we do uh, do something about that in the near future. All right, Councillor Dory. Mayor Oaks, uh, since our last meeting, um, Myself and several others attended uh, the VFW service on Memorial Day, and it was it was a wonderful service. And I just want to thank the local VFWs for putting that on on that special Memorial Day. Councilor Holmes, I thought you raised your hand earlier. I was just agreeing with her. Okay, <laughs> all right, all right. Um, I would just like to take a moment to welcome the school board members. Thank you for being here, uh, and our school superintendent. So thank you for being at the meeting. All right, next is an approval of the minutes 
I'll entertain a motion to approve the work session and regular meeting minutes of May 27th, 2021. Mayor Oaks. Councillor Mead. I move to approve the minutes of the work session and regular meeting of May 27, 2021. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'll second that. Right, Vice Mayor Robertson has second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Zinni, please call the roll. Ms. Dole. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, the next item is a recognition of Mark Holland for years of service to the city of Stanton. Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Mark Holland to come to come up here to the podium. How are you, Mark? I'm good. Good. Retirement suits you, I can tell. Yes, sir. <laughs> Lower stress. <laughs> and you've even let your hair grow a little bit, I can see. <laughs> Um, Madam Mayor and members of council, um, Mark Holland served the city for distinction, with distinction for many, many years. Um, just to, to remind council members and the public, uh, the Public Works Department is divided into four superintendencies. There's, the, there's streets, facility services and refuse, utilities, and then finally, traffic engineering and equipment maintenance. And uh, Mark served for many years as the traffic engineering and equipment maintenance superintendent. Uh, he first joined the city in May of 2001 after a long career in the United States Navy. And after about six years, he was promoted to the position from which he retired as one of the four superintendents who reported directly to the director of public works and so really part of that core management team uh, that that keeps things humming here in the city of Stanton and he served in that capacity uh, ably for um, the remainder of his time here with the city so I would like to personally express my appreciation to Mark for the excellent work that he did um, for the city during that tenure. And Mark Mayor Oaks has a certificate that she will share with the public and then present to you at the podium. Okay, the certificate says, City of Stanton, Virginia presents this certificate of appreciation to Mark P. Holland in appreciation of your con contributions to the betterment of the city of Stanton. The city hereby awards this honor for 20 years of outstanding service to the leaders, employees, and citizens of the city of Stanton. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my wife for sticking with me through thick and thin uh, and <laughs> some of the trials and tribulations we've had. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to uh, thank city council, the city staff, public works staff, and the citizens for allowing me the privilege of being part of the public works team for 20 years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Let me get my computer up. All right, next is a public hearing and consideration of a request by Billy and Peggy Vaughn for a special use permit for 320 North Central Avenue and 321 North Lewis Street for a child daycare facility. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, Rodney Rhodes, the city senior planner will present this item. Thank you, Madam Mayor Oak, city council members. Uh, before I start my presentation, I would like to note that Mr. Vaughn, one of the applicants for tonight's special use permit is employed by the city of Stanton. He has not spoken to myself nor any other staff member about this application in his capacity as director of community development for the city of Stanton. Did Mr. Blair make you say that? <laughs> <laughs> How'd you guess that? <laughs> um, as the mayor noted in the introduction, um, Billy and Peggy Vaughn are the owners of Bears and Blankets Academy of Early learning and have submitted an application for a special use permit to convert an existing building located at 320 North Central Avenue to a child daycare facility. Um, 321 North Lewis Street is also part of the application as a potential site for um, outdoor play area. 
But um, at this point, they are proposing to utilize the existing play area for their, um, at their child care facility at 315 North Lewis Street, which they have owned and operated since 1984. Um, this property, 320 North Central, is located on the west side of Central Avenue. It's between Pump Street and Churchville Avenue. I would like to back up and state that this property is zoned B2 General Business District. And in the B2 General Business District, there are lots of uses that are allowed by right. Some of them are quite intense. Um, you can have a convenience store, you can have a gas station, you have a tire recapping facility by right. However, there are several uses um, that require a special use permit to go through this public hearing process and daycare is one of those uses. I'm not sure why um, it is listed that way in the ordinance. I've thought about it in the past. Um, Council may rec recall just three months ago, there was another special use permit for another daycare, also zone B2 um, off North Commerce. So uh, the Vaughns are going through the same exact process uh, for property that's zoned the same. Uh, getting back to this property, um, historically the site was uh, ice. Um, plant, which is kind of surprising to me. That existing building was part of an ice plant years ago. Um, it um, um, later became Stanton Insurance Company, which closed in 2016 and most recently was used as office space for the Atlantic Coast Pipeline Project. Um, the occupancy of this um, site will be approximately 100 people. Um, for children and for staff, that will be based on social service requirements and also uh, the, the building code uh, will limit the number that can be there. The, the property has access to 25 off street parking spaces. This is a combination of spaces that are behind uh, the building on the property. There are also some spaces that are um, next to the alley that uh, is also behind the property. And also there is deeded uh, rights to I believe about 10 spaces along the side of the property that's actually part of the Dollar General Store property, but um, this property has deeded rights to use those parking spaces. Um, the, there's only um, two criteria um, established in the zoning code for evaluating daycare facilities and the states that there must be a fenced play area and that uh, the day daycare must meet the requirements of Virginia Department of Health. Um, as I noted previously, the applicants propose to utilize an existing play area that's um, on there where, where they currently conduct business. Um, and they are currently going through the requirements to get approval from social services and the Department of Health. All of surrounding properties zone B2 General Business District. The comprehensive plan uh, designates this area as commercial. Therefore, this application is consistent with that designation. And it's meeting on May 20th, 2021, the Planning Commission conducted a public hearing and considered the request. No one spoke in opposition to the request. I would note that no one has contacted the office um, by phone call, email, or letter from our adjacent property owner notification letters or from the, um, the advertisements we put in the paper for both of these public hearings. And at the conclusion of the public hearing on May 20th, on a five to zero vote, the commission voted to recommend approval of the special use permit with the following conditions. One, the property will, with the playground, if, I'm sorry, if the property with the playground is sold separate from uh, the daycare facility without first providing the required playground elsewhere, the special use permit will become void. Number two, building permits will be required to ensure compliance with the uniform statewide building code. Uh, number three, uh, portions of the property are in the floodplain and floodway. Therefore, renovations must comply with the City of Stanton floodplain regulations. And number four, failure to comply with any of these conditions will result in immediate revocation of the special use permit. I'd be glad to take any questions that council ha members have at this time or after you conduct the public hearing. Right. Are there any questions by council members at this time? I have one. Uh, Councillor. Um, uh, I just can't, I remember it might be in here, but can you, Mr. Rose, can you tell me how many um, new jobs this might bring? Wasn't there something in there about um, 18, is that right? We were informed that there may be as many as 18 full-time jobs associated with this. Uh, I believe the applicants can, can speak towards whether or not those would be, how many new. of those would be new jobs right. since they currently have a facility right, right next to it. 
I have one question. Uh, you said 1984. Um, was that the date that Peggy That's, and Billy opened up the uh, daycare? At 315 North Lewis Street. You guys cannot be that old. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Y'all were babies opening a, a daycare. All right. Um, any additional questions? Madam Mayor. Councilor Claffey. Billy said I had to ask my question. So I, wait, wait, I think Mr. Vaughn's going to speak after me. Oh, then we'll talk to her. <laughs> now, now, either one of you. Are the children going to be going from from Lewis Street to the playground on, uh, on the, from the facility on Central Avenue to the playground on Lewis Street? Do they have to cross that bridge? That hey, that is my understanding. I, I'll let Mr. Vaughn speak. Um, uh, about that yes sir Mr. that's what i reckon my question uh, is he's we're on the, the part on lewis i mean the part on central that's going to be the two places but at my understanding correctly that they also are going to continue to use the lewis street so that's correct basically three buildings now instead of just the one or three three entities versus the one um three properties, three I believe. properties. yes sir two okay. buildings i believe yeah. yes sir two buildings three properties yeah okay are there any requirements for that use of that bridge for which children are involved? It doesn't have any rails on that bridge, does it? No, sir, I do not believe it does. Is that a safety issue? I mean, I just drove by and looked at it and I was concerned. Uh, um, you, you may ask that uh, of Mr. Vaughn. Uh, staff did not see a, a safety issue with that. All right. Did you want to ask? Yeah. Billy, come on up. <laughs> <laughs> You told They're me already I, standing there. You told me I had to ask you a question. So. Uh, for the record, uh, my name is Billy Vaughn. Uh, this is my wife and my boss, uh, <laughs> Peggy Vaughn, and we reside at 16 William Street. Uh, I'll answer that question. The bridge has been there and has been in use uh, since we've been in that location. Parents park on the paved asphalt behind 320 North Central and walk across the bridge to the bottom, to the lower part of the uh, structure. We did not put railing on that bridge uh, for one reason that it would provide a clam climbing structure for the kids as they're crossing. <laughs> and for another, that bridge is in the floodplain, like much of Stanton, and the railing would uh, impede the flow of water and debris as it comes down through there. The bridge is structured in a way that there are metal beams, cross beams, and the bridge has, a ch has chains that go up under the the beams and connect to the bridge. So when the water rises, the bridge comes up and then floats back down. Sure. That was my design. Uh, that was his engineering. Has there ever been an issue um, concerning the bridge when it comes to safety? No. Okay. All right. So just, I'm, just a couple of questions yeah. that, you know. Yeah, sure. And said that uh, Peggy's been doing this for 35, 36 years. Um, I believe it's one of the best daycare centers in the area. Uh, she has a significant waiting list now. Mm -hmm. uh, if this is to be approved and we close on the property, and then she's able to address and provide services to those families that are waiting in the winds to get childcare. And as you all know, there is truly a shortage of quality childcare, not just in the city of Stanton, but in the state and the nation. So by doing this, uh, it will provide not just child care services, but new, new employment opportunities for probably upwards of eight or nine. Yes, and it's not just child care, it's early childhood education. I and mean, we actually have a curriculum, we have a program. I have trained teachers, I have degreed teachers in some um, instances. So it's, it's not just babysitting, right? We have a whole program. But I've could potentially double the number of children that I serve, so I could potentially double the number of people that I employ. Right, and licensing requires certain ratios, so I would have to abide by that. So, it's great, Peggy. How many children do you take care of now? We're licensed for sixty-four. Okay. So up to one hundred twenty-eight. Then. Okay. This is Carolyn Dull, Councillor uh, Dull. I I had a couple questions. Uh, well, one is to agree with the statement that there's a huge need for childcare. So having an expansion 
of some good child care is a great thing for the city just in and of itself. So uh, that's not really a question, that's a comment. My question is, Peggy, why do you let Billy's name be involved in this? Because we all know that you're the boss. He even said so. He's on the board. That's right. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> All right, great. All right, so now we're going to have a public hearing. When I bang the gavel, if you are for this matter, um, please come to the podium and say so. If you are against, um, please come to the podium and say so. Uh, I would ask that you give your name, your address, and you have five minutes to speak. And once I bang the gavel again, that means the public hearing is closed and I'll entertain a motion. So with that, the public hearing is now open. Anyone? All right. I'm hearing no comments. The public hearing is now closed and I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor Mayor. Oates. Councillor Darby. I move that council approve the special use permit for 320 North Central Avenue and 321 North Lewis Street with the conditions as recommended by the Planning Commission. Right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I'll second. Okay, we have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Zinni, please call the roll. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ocean carries. Congratulations. Thank you all. All right, the next item is item C, a consideration of procedural ordinance amendments. Now this is just the amendments, um, ordinance to the amendment, excuse me. I'll, I'll, I'm gonna let the attorney explain it, <laughs> Mr. Blair. Good evening, Mayor Oaks and Council. Uh, before you, as you recall last, uh, on May 27th at your last meeting during the work session portion of that meeting, uh, there were, as tonight, discussed a number of council procedure memorandums as well as ordinances. And three of those ordinances at the last meeting the council um, considered and listened to the presentation. And I just wanna briefly go through what which each one does. I'll try not to take up too much time, but um, the first is an amendment to Stanton City Code section 2.10.070. And what it does, it gives the council the ability by a majority vote to cancel a regular meeting, um, provided the council conducts at least one meeting per month. And the charter requires one meeting per month. Again, this is just clean up because again, I, that has been the practice of council to usually cancel a meeting during the summer as you did at your last meeting. The second ordinance amendment is to city code section 2.10.080. This is um, as discussed at the last meeting, uh, the state has amended the Conflict of Interest Act so that if by per chance, and this did occur in uh, Front Royal, Virginia, but, um, and also I think I mentioned the Charlottesville Downtown Mall was actually subject to a vote in which a majority of council had to um, abstain due to the Conflict of Interest Act. And there had always been a question and the state did ultimately clarify that if a majority of council has to abstain due to the Conflict of Interest Act, the rest of the council does form a quorum and can conduct business. And that's what that proposed ordinance amendment states. And then finally, count the uh, proposed city code section 2.10.095 simply states the memoranda um, of your procedures. This simply is a statement that your procedures are contained in those memoranda. And again, that's that's just clarification and transparency for the public. So if per chance somebody was on the website, they didn't go and, and I looked at the website before this meeting, you, you go to the city council uh, portion of the city website and you find a link to the memoranda. 
but let's just say somebody was curious, gosh, I don't know a procedural question. They just Googled and typed Stanton City Code. This at least, if somebody did that Google search and got on the code, if they looked at this, and again, I'm not saying they will, but it's just hopefully if they did, they would see that the council's procedures are contained in these memoranda. And so that's a brief synopsis of the three proposed ordinance amendments. I'm happy to take any questions. Are there any questions for Mr. Blair? Right. Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I move to adopt the amended ordinances for the following Stanton City Code sections 2.10.070 and 2.10.080 and to enact Stanton City Code section 2.10.095. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam Mayor. Councillor Clappy. I uh, will second it. All right, we have a second. Any further discussion? Um, Councillor Mead. Um, yes, I just want everybody to, to uh, to understand that uh, this process we've going we've been going through on with council procedure memoranda lengthy process that we've been going through and we will now be going through it at yet another city council meeting uh, that uh, that we can do this anytime we want to we don't have to wait every two years and in fact if a council procedure memoranda got in the way of somebody wanting to do something at any particular time we could simply amend it and vote on it, or the majority could vote on it. I just think that's an important thing to note about these council procedure memorandum. Okay, any further discussion? Ms. Zinni, please call the roll. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. And Mr. Holmes. Aye. Motion carries. Right. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Blair. Right, the next item is item D, a consideration of ordinance increasing the number of commissioners of the Stanton Redevelopment and Housing Authority. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, at your uh, work session um, last month, your, your second work session last month, um, you heard, I think, from both Mr. Blair and from me about um, changes to the city code uh, concerning the number of commissioners for the Stanton Redevelopment and Housing Authority. You may recall that when the commission was established in 1961 or when the authority was established in 1961, there was provision made for five uh, commissioners uh, to serve as the governing body of that authority. Um, there have been some discussions amongst uh, council members um, commissioners uh, who serve on the authority board, um, as well as the executive director of the housing authority about the desirability of increasing the number of commissioners from the present number of five. And uh, I, if I recall correctly, the, the draft ordinance prepared by Mr. Blair and presented to you at the last meeting um, provided for an increase in that number from five to seven. And we told you um, at that work session that we would look into the possibility of providing a bit more flexibility um, so that uh, you could provide, if you so desired, for a maximum number of commissioners, but not necessarily fill all of those seats um, if the ordinance was adopted, uh, establishing a cap. And, and Mr. Blair concluded that uh, that flexibility is permissible. So the, the revised ordinance that you now have before you this evening provides for the appointment of up to nine commissioners. So you can, you can consider that ordinance this evening and adopt it, but that does not obligate council to appoint nine commissioners. You can go from five to six, you can go from five to seven, you can go from five to eight, anywhere you wish within that, uh, uh, between that five and nine um, it would be acceptable. Um, and so uh, the ordinance is, is ready for your consideration and I'm sure Mr. Blair would be happy to answer any questions you have. Are there any questions for Mr. Blair? This is Carolyn Dahl. Councilor Dahl. 
I just want to uh, thank Mr. Blair and Mr. Rosenberg. I knew between them, they would find a way to give us that flexibility. <laughs> so Mr. Blair, right now as it stands, what's before us gives the flexibility of anywhere between five and nine? Correct. Okay. And uh, just but we're pointing seven. But or we're up, up to seven. Yeah. Appointing up to seven. However, if it were to go up to nine, it would have to come back before the council Correct. for action. Correct. And and just uh, Councillor Dole, um, just to uh, thank you for your comments and and to let you and the other councillors know that flexibility really came from an attorney general's opinion. Um, that the reason I feel like this is this achieves the council's objectives, plus it doesn't put the housing authority in a bad spot because that opinion stated it's the number filled that determines a quorum. What I was worried about is if you had up to nine in the ordinance, would you always have to have five, even if you just filled seven, would you always have to have five of the seven to fill a a quorum because it says up to nine, but that attorney general's opinion was clear that it the quorum is based not on the seats, but on who's filling the seats. So if you appoint two and have a, a SRH board of commissioners of seven, a quorum would be four. And what this really does is I'm assuming based on the conversation the council had, there will be two additional commissioners appointed. And then in the future, if the SRHA board comes to you and says, hey, we, we need two more folks, um, that's for council you can consider and either approve or deny, but you don't have to change the ordinance because you do have the authority to go up to nine. This is Carolyn Dull. Councilor Dull. Um, so, Mr. Blair, are you saying that I should have thanked the Attorney General instead of you and Mr. Rosenberg? <laughs> you know, thanks all around. <laughs> Thank you. So, essentially, um, right now we're looking at seven, but if the council would consider nine, it would have to come back before the council for a vote. It's just that's the only portion we'd have to vote on. We would not have to vote on the ordinance. Right, you would not amend your ordinance. You, you would not have to amend it. You could just approve two more account, two more commissioners. Okay, all right. Okay. Are there any other questions? Right. Councilor Holmes? I haven't served on this board. Is this, I know these two extra uh, members is really gonna help because it's hard to get a quorum on that. On, it had been hard to get a quorum on that board. Uh, and so a lot of times you didn't have meetings regularly. So, um, and then um, there's a lot going on there. So I think they're going to really appreciate it. All right. I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I move to adopt the proposed ordinance increasing the number of commissioners of the Stanton Redevelopment and Housing Authority from five to nine and to appoint two more commissioners at this time for a total of seven. We have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam Mayor, I'd like to second that. Councillor Claffey is second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Zinni, please call the roll. Ms. Dull. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, the next item is item E. This was added to the agenda. It's a discussion of Stanton Crossing. Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, Madam Mayor, um, I don't have anything to present to council on this item. So I believe it was added um, to the agenda at the, at the um, initiative of Vice Mayor Robertson. Perhaps he'd like to address the issue. Vice Mayor Robertson. This is simply a time um, that I think we'd like to hear from um, the school board and uh, the superintendent, Garrett Smith, is here to present um, their ideas for Stanton Crossing and, and what the advantages uh, of that piece of property would be for the, for the students and for basically the city as a whole for 
trying to help alleviate problems that have been going on for many, many years. Welcome, Dr. Smith. And Thank you so much, uh, Mayor Oaks and members of City Council. Mr. Venable is going to speak first, and then I'll follow after right. him. Welcome, Chairman Venable. Good evening. Mayor Oaks and City Council members, tonight I rep res uh, respectfully stand before you as the Chairman of the Stanton City School Board, which is elected by our citizens, as you know, to govern and advocate for our local public schools in the city. As elected officials, we, we all have the taking an oath and commitment to carry out our responsibilities to the best of our ability. Being members of the school board for the past three years, we collectively as a board have been working to move our school system forward in all phases and have made some substantial progress with the benefits of support from city council. One area that we are working on is to pull our maintenance department, bus transportation, and food and cold storage areas into one facility, which would help eliminate the current safety risks to employees and students and create sufficient efficiency and cost savings for our school system. And in doing so, also help the city's police department, public works, and parks and recreation department. Over the past several months, Dr. Garrett Smith, superintendent of Stanton City Schools, with 100% support from the Stanton City School Board, has been working along with his administrative staff on a solution. They put together a business plan that after, research, after searching all possible sites within Stanton that will fulfill their needs to get out of our 50, over 50 years of what was supposed to be temporary user space. The plan has been presented to your Economic Development Authority whose members are appointed by you and has been denied with several reasons that we all are, all are aware of. Yes, to say the least, we candidly were surprised and disappointed when the process and decision but we realize that the city council has an important role, voice and role. So we ask for your help and also the help for our students and employees. I have worked in the retail business and corporate arena for 40 years. And I am a bit dismayed after watching the existing process unfold in what I have to describe in unvarnished words. It was utterly not a collaborative process. Our board felt misled when we are doing our best to resolve a situation that has existed for up to 50 years. Why, why was it necessary and fitting to pay a consulting group to do a study that was supposed to be a cost benefit analysis on a building that is a part of Stanton, which will be used by our and your own Stanton City School Division and by your police and recreation departments. Then we were informed that the consulting group did not do it, excuse me, do it because they did not have enough time to do it. They had a month to get this done. One common uh, comment that kept surfacing from the EDA was that it would not look good to have school buses on that site and would scare off potential buyers with deep pockets. We propose substantial aesthetic measures to the property to manage any appearance issues. Moreover, the city is looking for the main entrance coming into Stanton to be Richmond Road. Building 126 is located on the back side of the property, Frontier Drive North, which is a side road off Richmond Road that is also not a retail corridor. This section of Stanton Crossing will not be retail. The new road through Stanton Crossing project, which VDOT is doing, will not be done until 2022. The EDA says that it can get as much as 75,000 per acre. The building we desire is on five acres. Five acres at 75,000 per acre amounts to 375,000 bucks. Our school board 
even formally approved, uh, approved our superintendent to offer 400,000 for this partial. We did not get any response to our offer. And it is going to cost our city, you and the taxpayers, over $100,000 to demolish the building. But we can save potentially millions of dollars to use it and not have to purchase another site and construct new buildings. The EDA majority seems to uh, suggest that its decision is final. But isn't that the EDA tail wagging the city dog? When it's the city council that was elected to govern our city, the EDA members were not elected. What among other things that perplexes our school board is how the EDA, an agency with all seven members appointed and approved by the city council can dictate that outcome in a situation where a solution is promptly needed by our own Stanton City Schools and would show large cost savings. In effect, hasn't your EDA just told the taxpayers of our city that it is imposing a tax increase? I understand that the Stanton Crossing has been eyed as high potential income dollars for Stanton. How could one six acre partial or five acre partial building to be taken out of the demolition contract, which must uh, contractually be done in just a few weeks, be thought to derail the four phases of development on hundreds of acres. And we have yet ha had identified to us any more than speculations about other potential bona fide buyers. After all these years, the EDA has owned the property that will produce high potential revenues to the city. The city and the Stanton City Schools need to always work collaboratively towards the future of Stanton. The youth are our future, not us. And our employees who have to work in the current conditions deserve better. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Again, we ask for your help. Some vote that imposes on the ADA, EDA at least a moral obligation to reconsider its decision that denies what is a very reasonable answer to legitimate needs. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening again, everybody. Uh, so this evening, I'm going to review some urgent problems facing Stanton City Schools, the conscientious steps we've taken to solve the problems, and the unfortunate roadblocks we've encountered. As you know, the school board offered the EDA $400,000 to purchase a building and six acre site for use as a consolidated operations facility. This facility immediately eliminates a barrier that prevents Stanton City Schools from making necessary physical improvements to Shelburne Middle School and expanding our career and technical education curriculum for 11 to 14 year olds. Both of these goals are essential components of the division's strategic plan. So there are four problems that we're trying to solve. One, uh, the first is insufficient space for education. Classrooms at Shelburne are crowded and we need the space currently being used uh, by our maintenance department to create more educational opportunities for middle school students, particularly in career and technical education. And I know we're all unmasked tonight and that's great to be there, but in schools, we're still masked up and we still have to physically distance. Those rules have not changed. So if you were to visit summer school anytime, and we hope you do, um, you would see that all those, those measures are still in place. Um, number two, uh, the second problem is inadequate facilities for our operations department. Our maintenance shop was crammed into the basement of the middle school 50 years ago. It was never intended to be its permanent location. Our bus lot is at Public Works again, never intended to be a permanent solution and is grossly insufficient for our employees. We've been there for 35 years. The bus garage where mechanics do maintenance on the buses is a gravel lot. And the office is a small trailer for 35 employees to pack into each school day. We're also borrowing storage space, for, space from Public Works that they need back. We've been told that Public Works will eventually need our transportation lot back for a new water tower. We're storing bulk food commodities at a third party warehouse and paying additional costs to store and transport the food. And finally, school vehicles are parked at numerous locations around the city. 
including a Dixon Educational Center due to inadequate parking space. Safety is another problem. Having the maintenance department in the basement of Shelburne is disruptive to learning and causes safety concerns for the students and for the employees there. When our maintenance staff is working on vehicles, fumes often travel up into classrooms, requiring teachers and students to evacuate until it's safe to return to the classroom. This is a disruption and safety risk that our students and staff shouldn't have to endure. The last problem has to do with efficiency. Our operations department is disjointed and spread out across the city. Bottom line, if we have the right facilities, a consolidated space, we work better, we work smarter, we get more accomplished and we save money. We've carefully studied these problems. We engage with experts and decision makers. We considered alternatives and we did our due diligence. We evaluated eight properties in Stanton, the Stanton Crossing site and seven others that are privately owned. Based on our analysis, the Stanton Crossing is the optimal solution. It can be implemented the quickest at the lowest cost and with the least impact on the city's finances. First, we need to move immediately because if we have to wait years to move maintenance from the middle school basement, we lose the ability to use federal ESSER three funds to pay for the remodeling of Shelburne CTE classroom. These funds must be spent by 2024. So when I first came in front of the EDA uh, in January, we didn't know about the ESSER three funds um, and we didn't know about the timelines associated with them and what we could use them for. When I came back in April, I made a point of saying that now we have the money to do the, the renovations at Shelburne, but like all of the money, there are strings attached, including um, timelines, and these funds have to be spent by September 2024, so we, we need to get started. Secondly, the privately held, held options will cost the taxpayers much more. In addition to the acquisition cost, each of the privately held options will, will require massive expenditures to make them usable. For example, some of the properties we examine are empty fields and we would require expensive site work. Some have structures on them, but in each case, they would have to be completely or partially demolished. The city saves $118,000 in demolition costs if it gives Stanton the Stanton Crossing building to the schools. All seven alternative sites will require new construction and some are not even zoned for our purposes. The Stanton Crossing site is designed for maintenance, operations, and storage. It's a perfect fit. The third factor to consider is that once SCS acquires a privately owned property, if that's what we need to do, it immediately and permanently stops generating property tax revenue for the city. Conversely, the Stanton Crossing site hasn't been taxed for decades, if ever, and is not likely to generate any taxes in the foreseeable future. Moreover, the best fiscal impact estimate shows that Stanton Crossing's future revenues would decline by a mere 2% if the schools took over the site there. Finally, I'd like to explain the events that led to my being here this evening. The school board had hoped the EDA would have given our proposal serious consideration when it was first presented to them in January. Unfortunately, the EDA, an appointed body, has exercised unchecked power to shut down a cost-efficient initiative desperately needed by the students and staff of Stanton City Schools. The proposed facility would have also solved space, space issues for three city departments, Public Works, Parks and Rec, and the Stanton Police Department. Moreover, the EDA has voted five to one to impose an unnecessary financial burden on Stanton taxpayers. During its April 22nd meeting, the EDA informed the school board that it was delaying its decision on the operations facility for another month until May 27th to procure a cost benefit analysis conducted by the Timmins Group. The cost benefit analysis was gonna be used as the guidepost for the EDA members to make this important decision. So we understood that, you know, we understood a cost benefit analysis. So you have some, some reasoning to make this important decision. That makes sense, that made sense to us. However, the Timmins group neither prepared a cost benefit analysis nor presented one in the May 27th meeting. When our school board members asked why the cost benefit analysis wasn't conducted, Mr. Vaughn responded that we didn't have time and it would have cost too much. Amy Ratchford, the school board vice chair and acting chair that morning as Mr. Venable was on vacation, 
asked if school board members could ask questions that have been prepared in anticipation of the expected cost benefit analysis. The, the EDA members considered the request, then voted unanimously to allow questions from school board members. However, only two school board members were permitted to ask questions before they were cut off, which is noteworthy because the EDA's own agenda memorandum stated that Mr. Davey from the Timmons Group would address questions. So in spite of all that, nevertheless, some, some EDA, EDA members determined that despite the absence of the cost benefit analysis that was supposed to be in place and to be discussed and to be able to ask questions, and, and despite not fielding all school board members questions, which they voted unanimously to do so, it was acceptable to go ahead and vote to reject the school board's offer to purchase the property. All discussion of the offer to purchase the property took place during a closed session, exacerbating the notion that this was not a transparent and collaborative process. So we really have no idea if our offer to purchase the property was considered or not. I wanna conclude by saying that despite our recent experiences, Stan City Schools remains committed to being solution oriented. Tonight, we ask you to request that the EDA reconsider its decision with one important new piece of information. We would like to request that the EDA remove building 126 from the demolition contract and lease it to the Stanton School Board until such a time that businesses are prepared to move into Stanton Crossing. This approach gives the school division the ability to access several million dollars of federal ESSER funds to remodel Shelburne in sufficient time to create a thoughtful development plan for an alternative operations facility. So what we're asking is to temporarily use the building until such a time that the businesses are ready to move in and that'll give us time to remodel Shelburne, do what we need to do there and look for a permanent home for our operations departments. That's what we're asking for. You see, the business of educating children is an urgent one. We don't have the luxury of time. In all aspects of the word urgent, we, we really mean it. It'll take years for the Stanton Crossing property to be up and running. Consider this. The cohort of students that started kindergarten when the EDA purchased the 330 acres of Western State has now graduated from high school. Can we afford to let our children miss out on the opportunities that come with the school division's vision for improved learning spaces at Shelburne Middle School, enhanced career pathways, and outstanding education from pre-K to 12th grade? We're ready to mobilize now. We've done our homework. We've lined up partners and our staff is willing and extremely motivated. In fact, they ask me about it every day. Thank you for your support in helping us provide a high quality education for the children of Stanton. And I'll also, uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Are there any questions by council members? Any comments? Councilor Mead. Um, is there a member of EDA here? I don't think so. So, so there's, the discussion is really limited to your presentation. Not, there's no presentation by the EDA to us as to why they made the decision they did. Not that I know of. Vice Mayor Robertson. Can, can we ask at this point that we would simply like to see to get to see if our city manager could come up and get the EDA, the school board, and city council together, and let's talk this out. I mean, is that is that to me that seems like a reasonable request? We've got I understand I understand what the EDA is doing. I mean, I understand that they're tasked with the job to provide the best benefit to the city of Stanton. But I also look at what I'm look, looking at here was we, all of us, had the ability to go through Shelburne and to go through that Building 126 and literally look at everything that was possible. And in my mind, th this is, um, I, I just don't see, I, I want to understand why that these three entities weren't put together in the first place before this, you know, before they had the opportunity to take this five to one vote. I don't understand why. I just don't understand why we couldn't get these three entities together. 
So I'm asking, can we, is it possible for our city manager to bring these three entities together to try to do something before this uh, action takes place? Mayor Oaks. Councillor Darby. I, I agree. I think this is a gift to the city of Stanton in lots of ways. And I would also like to see if the city manager could facilitate some kind of meeting to have to have this discussion to understand better and see if there's any kind of collaboration that can be done um, in regards to what Dr. Smith has presented here tonight. Madam Mayor. Councillor Clavy. I mentioned it. We we're burning daylight on this. We have until July the 3rd to notify the demolition company to not proceed and demolish building 126. And therefore, I'm asking City Manager Steve Rosenberg, is, is it possible that you can get these entities together to discuss the matter in a timely manner because we're down to three weeks? My answer to the question is that I certainly can, uh, you know, you all are in control of your own schedules and I can coordinate with Mr. Vaughn and Dr. Smith and see whether it's possible, if it's the will of this council, that I take that action to, coord to attempt to coordinate a joint meeting of the three bodies, I'm pleased to do so. We just heard from um, Councillor Claffey. I, I mean, I want it to happen. Right. Councillor Holmes. I just have a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, Dr. Smith, what would it cost you to bring that building up to your uses, uh, even if you weren't going to buy it? So um, the first thing that would need to be done is that it needs a roof repair. We already have a bid on the roof repair. It's about $300,000. We've also uh, had professionals come through to see the work that our own staff can do. Our own staff can do about a quarter million dollars of the work, and that would involve um, you know, ceiling tiles, some floor tiles, landscaping. Um, you know, we could we could put some of the the lighting in and those types of things. So I think, you know, our our total cost we have two point five million. Um, uh, you know, in our capital improvement uh, plan. You know, towards the improvements at Shelburne, we've also now, but now that we have the ARPA money to do the improvements at Shelburne. We can uh, work with Mr. Treyer and Mr. Wagner to figure out the best way to utilize that money. So to get it up, to get it up and running and hooked up and everything, um, I could come. I don't want to speculate uh, too much, um, but I can come back and I can send a you know a firmer number to you tomorrow. But in my mind, the way this would work is we get it fixed up well enough for our employees to get in there, um, and we continue working on it. Like we said, when, when the time comes that businesses are ready to move into Stanton Crossing, the building still belongs to the EDA, and then they can do what they want. They can keep the fixed up building while we move on to our next location. They can demolish it because it, it belongs to them. But what we're saying is we have a short window of time to spend this ESSER money. We have an urgent need right now. We think there's going to be a delay of, uh, you know, at least a handful of years before businesses are ready to move in there. So why not let us use it in the meantime, uh, do the best we can with it while we continue our search for a permanent consolidated facility. I think it's a win-win solution. It works for everybody. And again, like we said, um, you know, we, we wanna help city departments. It, it, will, it will help the police department. We've got a place there for their mobile command center. It'll get us off of public work so they can get their space back. And Parks and Rec, uh, they need a place as well. Um, if that building's demolished, um, then they, they've got vehicles and equipment in there as well. And, 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 and in our model, we share this space with, with everybody. Well, and do you think that, um, say, it takes two years to do Shelburne, would that, would you, the money you put into the, the building on at Stan Crossing, would, would that be an adequate return on that money? Uh, you know, that uh, you do, you spend to remodel the, the building that might be torn down. Yeah, well, I th yeah, when you when you compare it to the to those other sites we've looked at where you have to remove trees, um, level the ground, 
uh, put in a parking lot, put in roads, put in um, additional buildings. Yeah, we, we, we still think it'll be a money saver. Yeah, well, I, I, I went through the building with you, and I, I agree that it looks like it was kind of tailor-made for what y'all need. And, uh, you know, I just, uh, I really hate reversing the EDAs. Again, you know, it, it, you know, they're, they're supposed to be um, a body that is, is, is independent from us. And, uh, um, but also I understand, and I, I really do believe that that building was, was perfectly made for you guys. So it's really kind of a tough decision. Yes. So, you know, as far yeah. as, as what, you know, we, I don't think we have the right to tell the EDA what to do. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, that we could sway them to do what you would like. And, and, and yeah, we, we were hoping for a collaborative process um, the entire time, asked about, um, you know, being a part of it, if, if, if we couldn't be a part of it, to at least have the methodology explained to us. You know, we were well prepared to respond to a cost um, benefit analysis. We had several, um, you know, questions and points that we wanted to be considered in a cost benefit analysis because, you know, in a developer's eyes, a cost benefit analysis looks a lot different than it does through an educator's eyes. This is Carolyn Dole. Councillor Dole. First, I'd like to say that um, the, the whole purpose of Stanton Crossing, when we purchased it, was to provide jobs for our children when they grew up so that they could come back here and work and not have to go somewhere else. So for God's sake, we're not like a, uh, ignoring the children. It was all about the children. Uh, your, your permanent wish to buy it wouldn't create any jobs or any tax revenue or diversify at all. I, I'm not opposed to uh, if the EDA wanted to consider leasing a space for you to get out of Shelburne while you continue to look for somewhere else. But I, I could only see it being relevant for, uh, you know, a maximum of like four or five years maximum. And then that would be the end of it. So, you know, are we really talking about temporary? Are we just gonna, are, are we gonna just, you know, move in there and never leave? Well, you know, I appreciate your comments. I, I, I don't agree that it wouldn't create jobs because as we said, we're, ex we're expanding our CTE uh, career pathways and bringing them down to the middle school level. All of our directors, whether it's in maintenance, school nutrition, technology, we all take student interns um, and we train them up. This would enable us to do that at even a, a deeper level and we could reach more children. So I, I think we would create jobs and we'd be growing our own. All right, um, Councillor Holmes, are you in favor of a joint meeting? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. and. Councillor Darby's already yes. answered. How about um, Councillor Mead? Yes, she said. Okay, that. all right. Um, this does sound like a Hail Mary because we have until July 3rd, but Mr. Rosenberg, if you can try to herd the cats, it would be appreciated. We'll, we will uh, begin our effort to try to schedule a meeting among the three bodies um, tomorrow. We'll, we will begin that effort tomorrow. Okay. And I can assure you the school board members will be ready and willing to meet. Right. That sounds great. Um, and as far as the process, I, for one, would like to take this even further. Um, I would like to see more joint meetings between the school board and the city council, maybe starting in the fall, um, to start discussing the priorities of the That's school great. board mm -hmm. so the city council can properly budget and we can work together on the priorities that would benefit not only the school system but the city as a whole so maybe we can even start looking at joint meetings starting in october or, or even sooner great um would you believe that would help to uh, resolve yeah. I, I, I think further it's, problems? Always, yeah, it's always better to have that open communication we would certainly appreciate that absolutely absolutely Okay, well, uh, Mr. Rosenberg will be in touch. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, Garrett. Thank you. Take care. And I, I do want to, um, 
and just have it put on the record. The EDA does work independently from the city council. They are appointed by the city council. Um, however, when it comes to the Stanton Crossing property, they own the property. That is why we're needing to bring everybody to the table to discuss the possibility of, of leasing. Um, but at the end of the day, the decision will be up to the EDA because they own the property. All right, the next item is to finish up the um, procedure of memoranda. Good evening again, Mayor Oaks and Council. And, and I would ask for your indulgence just in one, one aspect of this. Um, there be a formal uh, motion and vote to amend the agenda to add this. That was not done at the end of the last session. Right. Spoken like a true attorney. Uh, exactly. But I, uh, we should, since we're talking procedure, probably. All right. <laughs> follow um, procedure. So it was um, procedure number 16 and 17 we need to complete? Yes, Mayor. All right. Fine. I'll entertain a motion. Madam, Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I'd like to make a motion that we add a uh, conversation uh, on amendments number 16, excuse me, 17 and right. eight. 16 and 17. 16 and 17 on the uh, memoranda. Uh, add that to the uh, regular meet at the end of the regular meeting, please. Right. Do I have a second? Councillor Claffey, a second. Any further discussion? All right. Hearing none, Ms. Zinni, please call the roll. Ms. Mead. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dull. Aye. Ocean carries. Right. Thank you. Now, okay. Mr. Blair. thank you so much. Uh, to continue, we were on council procedure memorandum number 16 and Councillor uh, Mead had asked a question and I had replied about what reasonable charges meant. Um, and I think we can go from there. Councillor Mead, did that answer your question sufficiently? Yeah, it's uh, pretty subjective. And, and as I said to you, there are probably some council members who spend four hours a month on city council business and others who spend 20 hours a month on city council business. So for some folks, uh, it would be a bargain and for others, it would be expensive. Right. Um, I had another question as well. Uh, so on an item number four, uh, addressing um, the thumb drive, providing a thumb drive so uh, since this is a new procedure, or a, uh, does yes. that mean that from this day forward, all those emails would be required? So that, uh, that for instance, Carolyn Dahl, uh, who has been on a member of city council for many years, would she have to look back through 20 years of, or 15 years or whatever it is of emails and supply those upon leaving office? That is an excellent question. And, and what I would uh, offer to you here is, and I don't want to go too deep down the, the FOIA uh, path, but the Freedom of Information Act, there's also something called the Public Records Act. And the Public Records Act uh, um, authorizes the Library of Virginia to establish a retention schedule for all government records. And it includes correspondence. And I believe right now the uh, retention schedule, it's three years you're required to maintain up to three years of your emails. And so to answer your question, when, you're, when your term expires as a counselor, any of you, you should provide the last three years of emails pursuant to this policy in the Public Records Act. But to your point about Counselor Dole, uh, she's been on the council much longer than three years, and so, but she would not be required per the Public Records Act to provide anything more than those three years of emails because that's what she's required to retain. And then, uh, and then, will you define public business? Yes, uh, the transaction of public business. There is a definition in FOIA. Um, I could look that up, but really it's, it's anything that relates to your council duties. Um, I'm happy I can put in the next 
briefing that specific definition out of FOIA, but it's, it's whatever relates to your council duty. So just as an example, let's say you had a Gmail account and in your Gmail account, there were emails about, <clears throat> you know, a beach trip as we're at the summer, right? That's obviously not public business. But if you had an email from a constituent concerning, um, you know, tonight, one of the, the matters, the uh, special use permit, you would be required to retain that. That's the transaction of public business. So it would be business that might potentially be on the agenda of a city council meeting or, or uh, anything uh, one in your, that would be voted on by a member by city council? Really, it's a little broader than that. Anything that's in your purview as a city councilor, right? Something that relates to your duties as a council. I think I would appreciate your putting I will. public business into that. Matter. I will. Councilor Mead, do you want the three years added as well? Yes, I think it would be important to note that there's a retention schedule. I, I will do that. Councilor Holmes. Uh, where, um, say, say, like this morning, I got a, an email to join a Zoom group for tourism board. Something like that is something you got to also keep or? Yes. Is it a big thumb drive? That's a giant thumb drive. Right. But, but, uh, right. The, the, the distinction here is, uh, talking to the city manager, the city already has the ability to access anything on your city email account. This go. is more about your A private personal, email personal account. Email. Right. That's so I don't know, that's Councillor that's Holmes, to your question, if that came in on I'll your make a point city. Of not having anything on my it's all on my ipad i don't <laughs> you know because i i got scared when i went to the foyer when we took sure. foyer classes when we went and it scared me to death and, and i think if i can just interject i think this is a really good moment to to reinforce this message um, probably stepping on mr blair's toes that just because you use a personal email address that doesn't exempt the communication from FOIA. If it, if it concerns the transaction of public business, but you've used your Gmail account or your Yahoo account or some email account other than your city email address, it's still subject to FOIA. And that's what I think Mr. Blair is talking about right. when he's talking about delivering three years worth of those emails on the thumb drive. Yes. If you've used Gmail or Yahoo or some non-city email address, on a regular or irregular basis to communicate concerning city business, those emails need to be delivered on the thumb drive when you depart council, if you include this provision in this procedure memorandum. Yes. And that's a, on a best efforts basis, or, I mean, what if you regularly delete uh, anything over a year old? Ah. I will. Um, That's why you use your city email address. Yes, I, I would. I, I know why you use a city yeah. email address. I'm just making sure that everyone's clear Correct. that deleting an email doesn't necessarily mean you don't have to somehow be responsible for it if it was one use. That's correct. If it's, whether it's city or private, you're responsible for retaining them for the three year period. Um, I would point out to uh, Councillor Holmes, the, the idea of the private email, and, and I don't know if the presentation you went to discuss this, the former mayor of Chicago, Rahm Emanuel, I believe the city of Chicago paid, I want to say it was close to a quarter million dollars over a case involving using private email accounts instead of city email accounts and not providing access to them. This is Carolyn Dahl. Yes. Um, if we're gonna if we're gonna add this, shouldn't we also be adding um, uh, all the plat potential platforms? You know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, pick one. You know, all of those, as well as text and um, yeah. and cell phone records. We can, I can, what I would probably do based on your suggestion, Councillor Dahl, is to uh, 
make a generic statement about you know public business conducted on private accounts and make it clear that that does include all accounts such as social media as well as emails um, yes. text as well now what i will say about um the social media it's it's an evolving doctrine right now um I don't want to go too deep, but again, I, I will just say there was a case out of Loudoun County, uh, I believe it was about two years ago, the board chair up there, Ms. Randall, um, denied access to a Facebook page, and the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals said she had to allow it per the First Amendment, which would imply then that it was a public record, everything that was on that Facebook account. Now, what I haven't seen reported very much in the media about this issue is, as you may recall, when uh, President Trump came in office, he had a, a very active Twitter account and he banned some people and he was sued over that, kind of under the same premise. Now, the Supreme Court just kind of threw this thing out and, and said, in effect, he's out of office now. They didn't really touch this issue. Um, and, and it was not an official opinion, but what they would call the, the uh, denial of a writ of certiorari. But it's evolving and there are other federal courts that have said, look, a social media account is private. Um, even if you're doing public business, you can ban somebody. I, again, my advice since we're in the fourth circuit is social media accounts, if you do public business, they're public records. But, it, but it's fair to say there is an evolved, you know, th this is not a, a settled question yet. The Supreme Court has not definitively said how to treat a Twitter or Facebook account. All right, so what's the council's pleasure? <laughs> I, um, I support the three years of emails being added and then the definition of public business. I support that, but text messages, but no. I support them, but uh, FOIA counts text messages and cell phones and uh, landlines and Facebook and all of that. Well, so, so we can either put it in there and be in compliance with the way FOIA uh, looks at it, or we can not, but you still have to not be doing public business uh, on all these different things and without turning it in when you leave, basically. With Madam Mayor, with, Mayor with all due respect, Ms. Uh, Dull, I, I disagree. Uh, there was some quite a few FOIA requests to every one of us about what was on our, our, our cell phones and text messages and- Private. Private, yeah, private stuff. And Ms. Wallace spoke directly with the FOIA council and they said, absolutely not. I had FOIA training today that said, that's not so. Well, that's what the FOIA council in Virginia said. So I'm just-, I'm just Well, but, sure you can have private things and you don't have to turn over private things, mm -hmm. but if you're conducting any kind of public business on your private cell phone or your private email account or your Facebook or Facebook Messenger or any of that, it's it's subject to FOIA. I, I agree with that. I just think that would I think in this case somebody was just trying to go on a fishing expedition and figure figure what was on each one of our cell phones. Councillor Holmes, Claire, um, would it be uh, prudent to to list whatever the four-year requirements are and just, and let it, and would that cover them? I, I was going to suggest that. I will, I will basically place the four-year requirements in this policy okay. about what is public business, what's transaction of public business, and what's a public record. And, and public record does include things like text, but again, it has to be in the transaction of public, public business. business. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Okay. All right. Council procedure memorandum number 17. Okay. Uh, this is something that I just 
it's something you'll see in a lot of localities um, with their procedure memorandum or rules of counsel. And what it is, is basically a condensing of your meetings and your meetings right now, uh, how you call them and what they are, they're all over the place. They're in the charter, they're in the city code and the state code has some provisions that relate to council meetings. What this memorandum number 17 does, it's just, it's really for your convenience um, in the sense of it spells out, you have an organizational meeting, um, you have your regular meetings and how they're called. Then you have a special meeting and how that's called. Um, and then at the very bottom, this is um, passed every two years in your resolution establishing your meeting schedules. It, it's the hazardous condition, which simply means for, I mean, the most common is simply snow. Snow being, if there's 12 inches of snow on the ground on a council meeting night, the mayor or vice mayor, if the mayor is unable to act, may find and declare the weather uh, makes this too dangerous or too hazardous to come in for a meeting. Um, and again, that's in the resolution you pass every two years at your organizational meeting. And I, you know, this, this policy is, is written I just wanted to condense everything so it's an easy, easy access for counselors to see how meetings are called if you ever have a question or any just generic meeting question. But Councillor Mead had also wanted to add a provision um, if this council procedure memorandum is adopted about town hall meetings and town hall meetings. Um, they are, in her proposal, it would be one or two members of council um, wishing to conduct a meeting to hear from citizens on a specific topic or topics, and a counselor or two counselors, because again, you don't want to invoke FOIA, would at least two weeks in advance ask the city manager um, to use a city space and if they would like to use the Zoom platform to conduct a town hall meeting with constituents. Um, that's, again, that's Councillor Mead's proposal. And as I've done with all the others, I'll let her expound on that if she wishes. I think you've done a pretty good job of explaining. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Council members, your pleasure. I, I don't have a problem with that. Um, I personally am not in favor of it. I mean, that, that's what we as a council come together and we listen. If, if, if there's an important enough subject said, hey, let's have a town hall. And we come up and we vote on it and all of us get together and have a town hall. Kind of have that at, like when we did the West End thing over at yeah. kind of a town hall meeting uh, uh, at, when it was at uh, the gymnasium uh, about the you know uh, redevelopment of West Side. You were there, me, me and you were there. I mean, so, I mean, you know, we didn't sponsor it, but we didn't sponsor it, but, you know. And therefore, it's not official city business. Well, would it be but city this, business? This if, would be. A, yeah, I think it's more just wanting to use the space, isn't it, Brenda? This, this would actually generate city policy or procedures? No, no, this would not. This would simply be uh, an opportunity to hear from constituents and, and do so. Uh, uh, using uh, the Zoom platform, I, that would be my intent anyway. I mean, uh, folks in this room have had town hall meetings. I, I don't about, see- But you're talking about being able to use the facilities here where it's set up. Yeah, I, I, my, my preference would be to use a Zoom platform because I think you get more citizen response for that sort of thing. But uh, other uh, you know, uh, for those who, who want to look to what other localities are doing, I think other localities do this on a regular basis. Charlottesville, for instance. They do. They, there are other localities that have town hall meetings. Um, Albemarle, they do it. They, they kind of do what y'all were describing about the West End. I know the uh, supervisor Malik, Ann Malik, uh, she typically holds a town hall that the county advertises on its website. 
I believe they use a library facility in Crozet. And she does it usually during budget season and has a town hall to hear from constituents about the budget. And I think that's close to what y'all were talking about with the West End. I'm sorry, did you say she has it at City at the Hall? Library. No, at the, at the library. library in Crozet. Right. So I'm, I'm trying to understand the purpose of this because I mean, it wouldn't you already be able to reserve the chambers or the gymnasium at at Gypsy Hill? I think you could. I mean, but this, this again, that the city manager is in charge of city property. Um, this is more just, I, and again, it, per councilor me, this is more to put this in your policy just to let it be known. This is a type of meeting, even though it's not a FOIA meeting that council can hold. All right, what's the council's pleasure? Is this in addition to organizational meetings, regular meetings, special meetings? Yes, sir. That's enough. <laughs> so you, you all wouldn't mind if I decided I wanted to have a town hall meeting and use the Zoom platform, the city platform, that you don't have a problem with that? Or, or you Would do we have be a invited? Uh, well, you know, no as long as two. no more than two city no council members two, showed yeah. up. Only... I, I do not have a problem. However, I don't know that I mean, that's it's going to be done anyway. I, I mean, I, I, I can see what you're saying, but, but is it, how much expense is that extra expense? Is that going to occur on the city? For, I mean, is it going to incur any extra expense? I mean, to set up you know, for the personnel to set up the Zoom accounts and everything else? And, no, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm just asking. We have to pay for Zach and everybody to run. Well, it, it would it would require staff resources, whether that's during the regular work day or in the evening. Um, I'm talking about having one every week or every two weeks or even every month. You're just probably talking about having them maybe two or three times a year, maybe. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know how, I don't know what you're thinking, Brenda, but I mean, you know. Uh, this is, this is Carolyn Dull. I, I, my question is what harm would it be to, to have this memorandum? I, what, what would it hurt? It's just formalizing something that people have done informally in the past. So I don't, I don't see what the problem would be. I don't see the difference between that and the special meeting. The special, special meeting would be the entire body, entire council. all of city council. And it would be noticed as this a special have, meeting, a maximum of no two bearing on city council policy well it would just maybe bring information into council people to make us aware of things that maybe needed to be worked on you know it could be maybe it could be infrastructure maybe it could be you know for example mr claffey if you know there's a current consideration of the expansion of the middle river regional jail okay. and eventually that's going to come to this body for approval or disapproval. Um, if a member of council wanted to conduct for their own purposes, a town hall meeting to receive input on the proposed expansion from the public to inform their own decision about how to consider that particular issue. That's, and that's just one example. You know, we could come up with other hypotheticals, but that's that that's using something that's actually going to happen. Um, then, I, then, then I think that what Ms. Mead is suggesting is that she could use the facility and the systems to have a meeting where citizens could come and provide their input that that council member, along with another, could consider in making their decision. All right, I get you. I get what you're saying there, but isn't this in contradiction of where we were saying that individual council members are not authorized to incur money spent by the city? So, so I mean, the $250 that was, it was argued earlier that the mayor is the only person that's allowed to incur a, a cost of $250. But by doing so, you'd be involving 
Zach and the IT people and facilities and, and it not this an opportunity for council people to be spending city money? I'm happy to pay for it myself. I, I think that's a stretch, Mr. Claffey. Uh, you know, if people are wanting to hear from uh, the citizens on an issue, whatever it is, or just to brainstorm like, do we need public art in Stanton? And just let people talk about it. Uh, that's doing the city's business. But we, we're not hiring um, staff. And I can run Zoom. I can't imagine who couldn't. Uh, so I, don't, I, I still don't see what the problem is. I, I don't get it. Right, Mr. Clappy, are you in favor of it or not? Really, no. Okay. Vice Mayor Robertson. Personally, I'm, I'm not, but that's... Right, and Council Member Mead, we know yes. Councilor Holm? Councilor Darby? No. All right, I'm not either. Okay. How about the remainder of the policy? 17 is, is the rest of it outside of the town hall meeting? Is that... Everybody, I'm okay with the rest of 17? I don't know. Is it causing us to spend money? I don't know. No more so than um, what a regular meeting would cost. Okay. I think you okay. have everything. Is there right, anything I else? I will have these uh, for you at your next meeting for your consideration. Thank you, Thanks, right. sir. Thank, Thank you. Work. Appreciate it. All right, so the next item on the agenda is matters from the city manager, Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I have one item and it's an administrative matter and how long it takes, I think, is up to each one of you. Um, so I, I, I toss the ball into your court in advance. Um, we have, uh, you can see we've um, reopened the public seating fully. Um, we left the configuration uh, for council in place as it has been for the last several meetings until we could have this conversation with you um, about seating for council members going forward. Um, I will tell you that it's our intention to continue uh, with council holding both its work sessions and its regular meetings in council chambers for the foreseeable future because um, the caucus room, if, it's, if, if members of the public attend the work sessions in the numbers that they have been attending them in council chambers, I would suggest to you that it will get awfully crowded in the caucus room. And so, uh, so my suggestion is that for the time being, the work sessions continue to be conducted here in council chambers. Um, we have, I, I, I've conferred with the mayor. Uh, we have a suggestion for you for um, a layout for council with all council members seated at the dais. This has not been an issue that we've had to consider since this new council was organized in July of 2020. Um, so we haven't had to deal with the question of who sits where. And so I'm gonna pass out hard copies and Ms. Beauregard is gonna uh, place it up on the screen. And I'm gonna ask uh, Zach Henry to make sure that uh, Carolyn Dull is able to see this on the, on the Zoom platform. So just to step you through it um, from the perspective of the public, starting on the right and moving to the left, we have Ms. Mead, Mr. Claffey, Mr. Robertson, Ms. Oakes, Ms. Darby, Mr. Holmes, and Ms. Dull. And Ms. Beauregard and I will take our places back uh, at the left side of the dais. Mr. Blair will be uh, seated where he is presently, and Ms. Zinni, of course, will continue in the clerk's seat. Uh, again, this is based on uh, consultation with Mayor Oaks, and um, we're not wedded to this. This is ultimately up to city council, and um, we're prepared to take your direction. 
Right. Any comments by um, Councillor Holmes? I like this spot because they took that light out so it wouldn't have glare for me. Because uh, the glare on my screen really bothered me. I, I mean, and that's why. It, so you want to switch with Carolyn yeah, Dole? Yeah, I'd like to stay right here. All right. And Councillor Claffey. Whatever. Okay. Because I know you had indicated. Well, stay I like it over here with Rachel. Yeah. yeah. Whatever you want to do. It's fine. <laughs> All right. Vice Mayor Robertson? I mean, I'm fine. Councillor Mead? I'd like to know if everyone's been vaccinated. Absolutely. Well, yes, I'm. I, I we actually you cannot ask that question. Yeah, except that you're asking people to you know, cancel. Uh, um, I'll ask Mr. Blair for an opinion on that. Concerning that, uh, there are ADA issues. Um, I would need. Uh, we we cannot inquire as to somebody as an organization you cannot inquire and into an as to uh, have you been vaccinated per our policy now uh, again that's sort of a complicated legal issue the eeo has issued guidance but again the guidance does talk about the ada and you are not allowed if somebody has a disability to inquire into that then yeah. i can't go along with this Ms. So you're sitting at the end. I, you know, I'm not going to ask Carolyn Dahl to sit next to somebody who has not been vaccinated. I'm not going to ask Terry Holmes to do that. We're reducing this, the distance between people significantly. So I think if you're asking me if I approve of this without having, without knowing people's vaccination status, then I'm going to say, no, thank you. I like it right here. Miss Miss Mead, I mean, with all due respect, I mean, Robert's when I, I you got rather testy with me when I point blank asked you. And you know, so now you have your, you know, going with her. Of course, and the other thing is in you a, were crawling up in my space. Well, and, 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 I asked and you because that. I knew that I had been vaccinated and I have, and I don't mind telling you, but I also know that and from a medical standpoint, if you have been vaccinated, you don't have to worry. You're not going to get it. That's not I, true. That's yes, not sir. True. It is. It's not true. Now, I differed. I, I beg to differ with you. What about the Indian variants? It, it's, 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 right now, it's going all through. I'm, I'm telling you point blank with every with the vaccinations that the United States currently has, they are 100 percent effective against the variants and what there is. That's not true. What did you yeah. saying that? It's not true. Well, I beg to differ. Okay. Madam. Yes, you're yes. giving an opinion. Oh, hold on, hold on. Why don't hey guys, we? Uh, hey, Mr. Rosenberg, Mr. Rosenberg has the floor. I, I just want to offer up the possibility that if council members, if all of you are satisfied with the current arrangement, there's no reason to make a change. I'm perfectly happy where I am. Uh, if, if that's, you know, if, you know, we are, our general sense was that we would try to return as much as possible to, yeah, and I don't have um, uh, you know, what I would call normal arrangements. Obviously, I'm suggesting you vary from that by not conducting your work sessions in the caucus room because I think it'll be very crowded in there. But if if we're not yet at this point, then there's no reason that you can't continue to be seated where you are now, and we can revisit it at a, at a subsequent date. What's the pleasure of council? So what, so what is the procedure? Because I'm, I am very hopeful that I will be at the next meeting. Um, but I, I, I could live with where I'm at, but I thought the, the current thing where you were going to draw straws or something to decide who set where each meeting, correct? That does not we, we, that I, I believe Ms. Dole, my recollection is that at one point that was um, a suggestion that we had 
made, but that was before the, you know, the, the, the before the governor's executive orders expired and the declared emergency, I've, e I've sent you an email even this evening um, communicating the governor's intention to allow the declared emergency to expire as of June 30th. And so, you know, that, that's, that's all indications to me that um, we're going to be moving back into, Normality. you know, a, a period that is uh, more similar to, you know, how we conducted business before March of 2020. And so, um, you know, the, the, the drawing of straws, if you will, was intended to uh, address some of the uh, continued uncertainties uh, that were associated with the fact that we remained um, in a pandemic and in a public health emergency. And with those um, coming to an end, uh, and in fact, on your next meeting agenda, we'll have an item for this council to consider a termination of the locally declared emergency. Um, so with all of those items coming to an end, um, it's, it's our intention to, it, 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 it is, had been my intention to come up with a seating arrangement that um, would be used going forward without change. It makes a difference. I'll, I'll sit here because there's not much of a glare as long as you don't replace that light, you know, because I don't really, I, I just moved my, my iPad over there and it wasn't, when I had, when I sat here before, it gave me a headache because of the glare coming down on, on my screen. And um, so I could sit here. So that's not a problem. Okay. But that's not what the list, that's not what the diagram says, Terry. That's, that's what it is now. And you would, <laughs> You'd be on my, you would be on my right and, 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 uh, yep, I don't want to do that. Okay. There is one point I want to make. Um, at the beginning of the meeting, I asked people, uh, to please wear their mask if they have not been vaccinated. But if you have, you do not have to wear it, but you can wear it if you so choose to do so. And I don't see any one of us wearing a mask. The, the fact is many people don't wear masks and haven't been vaccinated. That well, means nothing. Say, no, this council members, I'm talking about the council members, not one council member is wearing a mask. Well, I don't know what that means. It means no one's wearing a mask. That's all that means. Per, per the request that I made at the beginning of the meeting, if you have been vaccinated, you do not have to wear a mask, but you can do so if you so choose. If you have not been vaccinated, we ask that you please wear a mask. However, we're not going to point blank ask you if you've been vaccinated. And, and, Ms., and Ms., none of us are wearing a mask. And Ms. Dull, I mean, I reckon the other point is if, if you want to wear a mask in here, you're more than welcome to. But I mean, if you're going to use that standard after June the 30th, when basically the emergency is over, then I mean I don't understand what you're doing. But if you want to come into the if you want to come into council chambers and wear a mask, you're welcome to. Go no, ahead. I want those who I don't know whether they've been vaccinated or not not to be near me. And the this is open that building is open to the public, and I guarantee you there are people attending who have not been vaccinated. Well, then then basically you're saying then that you're going to wear a mask from now on. No. Uh, no, there has to be a, an accommodation, and it doesn't mean I have to do that. Well, right now, trying to figure out the configuration of the dais, um, where would you like to sit, Councillor Dole? Well, I could sit where the diagram shows, but I would like to have plexiglass put up that extends past me and goes up in the front so that I'm somewhat protected from those who may not have been vaccinated. You could take them off the golf carts. I'm sure they're not using them. Well, then what councilor members are spending money? Oh, but you can vote on it. That's the thing. Certainly. All right. 
So what's the council's pleasure? Stoll wants to sit down there. She can't, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I just like to have everybody back in councils. I mean, I mean, chambers, I, I mean, well, I, I, I don't know that that's the decision that we're looking to make. I'm, this just, evening, trying Vice to, Mayor I'm Robertson. just trying to get her back here. Ms. Dole, if, if, this is um, the decision you're trying to make. if I don't know whether you, so you can see on, um, Zoom, there's an empty table in front of the dais. I'm not sitting at the kids' table. Nope, not doing it. That's what we were going to, um, draw straws about. Mr. Holmes, I think you previously expressed a willingness to sit at the children's table. Is, is that correct? As long as I get ice cream. <laughs> so, Ms. Dole, if you were seated at Mr. Holmes' place, would you still be looking for some sort of protective separation? Sure. There's still going to be people, unvaccinated people coming to the meeting. can require people I mean, like i said carolyn i mean co th th there is no way to ask, start asking people we're, we're not going to violate that right there's no way to ask everybody that comes in this building whether you're vaccinated or not and if those are the rules you're setting forth then that means i, you're I never, never said that i said because there will be people who are not vaccinated i need protection well then you might as well put a cotton picking bubble around you and walk around with a bubble around you from the day from now on. That's helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so Mr. Rosenberg, let's just proceed um, for the next meeting as we are sitting at tonight's meeting. And Councillor Holmes, do you mind sitting at the children's table, so to well, speak? I don't have to if we're gonna stay while we are. I can well, no, I can, um, by the next meeting. Um, well, if we work it out, if we work it out, I'll move down there. I don't mind. But, uh, I don't, Councilor, I'll, I'll, I'll sit in the back of the room if you want me to. Okay, but what I'm saying is Councillor um, Bell should be back by the next meeting. Well, if if there's protection here for her, I guess, to make her feel comfortable. Okay, I don't well, know then we, we I don't deal know with some other have. issues that Mr. Blair, we would have to look into. I don't know if it's, you, I, I don't see what that, you're that talking nice. about a plexiglass. I mean, I mean, I guess you could have something that sets out here and come, you know, it's still gonna air, it's gonna be circulating, you know, so. Here, here's my real concern, folks. Uh, statistically, 20% of people will say they're vaccinated and they won't be. So that that's, I think, Carolyn's concern. It's my concern. It's the fact that we are in a public venue in a space that's not well ventilated. I, I, I have been vaccinated. I don't mind saying that. But, but statistically, 20%, one out of five people, will say they've been vaccinated. But Well, we're talking about the dais uh, with yeah, the city council members. Yeah, and I again, none of us are wearing masks. So that, yes, an that answers know. your question. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the 20% up there. In a room with this ventilation and people sitting here this long, you know, it's, I mean, we're here four hours, five hours. It doesn't make any difference where you sit. If somebody comes in and the, the, the virus will go all through the room. There's just no way that you can do anything about that. You know, and I, I mean, even, even if we build a booth, for Carolyn, I don't think that that's going to solve that problem. You okay. Know? I mean, so we'll keep the current configuration. All right. We'll see whether we have anything. You know, we had a we had a divider up here that Mr. Claffey was quite fond of, yeah. um, and we, you know, so that may give us something to place on one side of of the seat up mm -hmm. here. Is, well, is Ms. Well, Dole willing to come back I next I, I don't know, but right now I'm concerned with the configuration. Yeah, I know. And, I know. And Steve, I've got about 10 sheets of plexiglass if you want to put, get somebody to make it into something. Because I, I bought it when, when I thought I was going to have to put it in the restaurant. And, and then they wouldn't let us use the bar. So I've got sheets of plexiglass if somebody knows how to do anything with it. I just, uh, you know, and I'd, I'd like to actually get rid of it. Okay, I'll tell you what, for the next meeting, let's have the same setup 
Councillor um, Holmes, again, if you don't mind going to the table I in front of you. Going, I don't mind going and down. then um, Councillor Dole um, is expected to be back. You know, if it turns out that there um, is a special request, medical request, then Mr. Blair and Mr. Rosenberg, we can handle that. Um, otherwise, if there's no special medical request, then we can provide, if the council does not mind, a plexiglass for Councillor Dole or Councillor Dole, you can choose not to come. And I'll say, Mayor Oaks, we'll, tr we'll see what we can do. Okay. Um, you know, it's not without expense. Um, you know, we looked at, at, at the front end of the pandemic, we looked at dividers at every place and to have them fabricated in a way that fit the dais and, you know, made them stable and, um, you know, meaningful. Um, well, you know, the, the expense should be considered by the council. Whatever. Do what you got to do. Okay. It, 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 you know, it, it, if it's something that's de minimis, I would suggest to you that that you allow us to move forward with it. That's what I'm asking the council. Yeah. Yes, Councillor yes. Darby Holmes. Do. Makes her feel more comfortable. By okay. All, means. all right. Let's do it. Thank you. All right. Yes, you're going to get ice cream. <laughs> we'll make sure it. of it. I'll buy you ice cream. It's, it's minimus. Black raspberry. Black raspberry. You like clients? All right. So the next <laughs> item on the agenda. Uh, Mr. Rosenberg, that was it. That was it. All right. The next item on the agenda is matters from the public. Um, okay, I've been requested to have a five minute break. So we are now on break. We'll be back in five minutes. Yeah, you came over. I think everybody's excited about having it again. Well, actually, okay, I called the meeting back to order. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <laughs> A break. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, it was right. All right. I'm just going to go ahead and read some rules for matters from the public. Matters from the public. This part of City Council's agenda is entitled Matters from the Public. It is a time that Council sets aside to hear from citizens and others about a wide variety of subjects. But before we begin, I'd like to share five basic ground rules that we ask you to respect as you make your remarks. One, please come to the podium, identify yourself, complete your remarks within five minutes. I will let you know when you've reached your five minutes. We ask that you please give your name, your address, and then keep your remarks at five minutes or less. When you reach the five minute time, I will let you know that your time limit has expired. If you continue to speak, I will ask you to step away from the podium. If you continue to speak after I inform you that you have exceeded your time limit, I will again ask you to please stop speaking and step away from the podium. If you still continue to speak, you may be charged with disorderly conduct under Virginia Code Section 18.2-415A2. Two, this is a time for us as counsel simply to listen to your remarks in an effort to encourage and maintain orderly conduct we will not engage in give and take debate. If you seek information, you may mention it during your remarks and the city manager or his staff may get in touch with you in the days ahead. Three, we ask that you direct your comments to council as a whole and not to identify members of council or to identify employees of the city. If you wanna take up an issue with an individual member of council or an employee, please speak with us before or after the meeting. We are also accessible by phone, email, or mail. Again, we ask that you direct your comments to the council as a whole. Four, we expect every speaker to be civil and courteous, using profanity, making personal attacks on an individual unrelated to the performance of their duties on behalf of the city of Stanton, and doing anything that is disruptive to the orderly conduct of this meeting will not be tolerated. Five, Finally, as the presiding officer, it is my duty to remind you that if you choose not to abide by these ground rules, I may find that you are out of order and ask you to withdraw from the podium. We certainly do not want to reach that point and even beyond. So we respectfully ask for your full cooperation in observing these guidelines. If you wish, you may obtain a copy of the ground rules from our clerk of council 
Ms. Zenny. And now we welcome all speakers. The podium is now available for matters from the public. Hi, welcome. I think you know me, Joanne Tiger, 913 North Augusta Street. I won't be long. I've been a homeowner of two different homes in Stanton for many years. The first one was on the West End um, of town and uh, now on North Augusta Street for quite a few years as well. Please come by, use my little free library. Um, if you ask, you can come take a tour of my gardens. My gardening with a trowel and reading are my hobbies. So anyway, that's beside the point. Uh, now that my husband and I are both um, in our later years, um, our financial situation is not what it used to be. It's somewhat tight. Having a yo-yo daughter, uh, 30, Five, I think, who seems to go out and then come back, go out, come back repeatedly. And her 10-year-old, beautiful, wonderful Lila June, um, that tends to make, um, you know, finances even worse. But anyway, um, I pay my bills on time. I um, try to be as good a person and citizen as I can be. And I think I'm pretty good at that. Um, I'm even an elder at First Presbyterian Church, believe it or not. Um, I had to save for quite a while to pay my property taxes this year, which usually I hadn't had to. But because of things being tighter now, I, I had to prepare and plan and save for a while. Um, all that said, just a little background, the restrictions that you've imposed on the matters from the public tonight, um, really from citizen input, really disappoint me, um, the changes. You all chose to run for city council. You had signs made, you campaigned, you wanted this job. You didn't just fall into it. You wanted to be a city councilor. You knew that there would be late meetings. You knew that there would be people wanting to talk to you in meetings, outside of meetings, emails, phone calls, whatever. You knew that there would be two meetings on Thursdays a month, that they would be late. You campaigned for this. And now you, you just can't be bothered to be late on two Thursdays a month. And that disappoints me. If I were in your position, I would be embarrassed to say, I can't be bothered to stay late two Thursdays a month. I would, I would truly be embarrassed. I taught elementary school for quite a few years and loved most of those years very much. And to me, you all are, most of you all are acting like elementary school bullies. And I ask that you please grow up. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, hey, welcome. I'm Carter Hopkins. I live at 632 West Frederick Street. And I have two overriding concerns. Number one. Barring the elderly, disabled, and those who are immune compromised in a pandemic, and we are still having a pandemic, believe it or not, from using the telecommunication system that we have and that taxpayers paid for, believe it or not, in order to express their citizens' concerns, in my mind, amounts to discrimination. Second, the matter of council's fiscal responsibilities. For example, the money spent to purchase a new fleet of golf carts for Gypsy Hill Park Golf Course, according to the newspaper this morning, was <laughs> about as much as it would cost. In fact, it was a little bit more than it would cost to, con to comp go on with our recycling system. And Sam, the 
Gypsy Hill Park Golf Course serves a very small portion of the citizens of Stanton, whereas the recycling system serves us all. Those people who have no cars, who are old, who are disabled, would have a very difficult time to get their recycling to Gypsy Hill Park, as it's been said we'll, we will do. I find that really discouraging when even the smallest town in their country is working on having recycling. And I think it's a sad state that our city can't continue having recycling. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello again. Uh, my name is Dr. Ann Hunter, and I'm a founding member of Reclaim Augusta. Um, for those of you who don't know about it, it's a grassroots organization that was founded in early 2018 to advance um, local self-government and the rights of nature. That's why I care so much about the silenced Stanton campaign. It's part of our mission. Again, I wanna emphasize that it's, the mission is nonpartisan. It is about local democracy and it's important that we not make it a partisan issue. I am hearing more and more that it is being made into one liberals versus conservatives. And that was made very clear at the last meeting. It was very disturbing. Secondly, um, last, when I spoke at the last meeting, um, I was attempting to finish my final sentence when I was cut off rather disrespectfully, I don't think it was intended to be disrespectful, but I have a suggestion that when that five minutes is up, that the person speaking be allowed to finish their sentence. That's all I was attempting to do. And I have, as a professional, I have spoken publicly many times with time limits, and I've always been warned when my time was close to being up so that I could wrap up my, my final thoughts. And I'm asking that we have that same protocol here out of respect for the speakers. If things had developed the way they seem to be going, where I was trying to finish my sentence and then was being threatened by having a police officer remove me from the podium, that would not have looked good. I would not have responded well. Nobody in this, well, maybe some people would have responded well, but many people would not have responded well in this room that night. And all the people that are listening and watching on Zoom, this would be another unpleasant situation that would get a lot of public attention. And I don't want that. And I don't think you want that. So I think we need to tone down the intimidation factor. Again, I don't know if it's intentional, but it is being experienced that way. There are better ways, speaking as a psychologist, there are better ways to manage how we communicate with one another in this forum that are not authoritarian. So I ask that we, we think about that some more. Um, also the town hall idea, the town hall meetings, that is very compatible with local self-government. And if any of you were to Google it, you would find out that the places like Charlottesville that have town hall meetings regularly have um, the public is very happy with that opportunity and it gives you an opportunity to talk more to us and explain where you're coming from. So I am a big proponent of town hall meetings and I hope that you will reconsider offering them. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Oh, 
Did you have something else? Oh, no, she, somebody said one minute. So I was thanking her for saying one oh. minute because that tells me I'm close. So um, there was a final thought, now I'm losing it. Oh yeah, so um, again, I was not available to come earlier to the meeting and to hear the discussion about what um, restrictions there might be for speaking from matters from the public. Um, and so I was listening on Zoom and was very grateful that I could do that. So that's been a wonderful development um, for those of us who like to participate in the meetings and know what's going on. So the very final thought is um, 30 minutes, maybe plenty of time at some meetings and some meetings it will be way too little. So I think we, we need to consider the fact that you, you live in a city where there are many people who want to be civically engaged and let's give them the time they need as many of them Your who want time to speak. is up. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. All right, is there anyone else? All right, hearing, yes, sir. Sorry about that. My name is Albino Albert Fossa. I live at 401 Bowling Street in Stanton. I'm having a problem with the assessor's office. Okay. Of course, you all know that the prisons are filled with honest people. Very few of them have integrity, knowing the difference between what's right and what's wrong and doing the right thing. At one time, it was government of the people, by the people and for the people. I'm not quite sure whether that's true here in Stanton. I have asked the assessor for an appointment. He refuses to give it to me. He gave me one appointment, but that appointment was in conflict with another appointment that I had. So seven days before the appointment with the assessor appeal group, I notified him seven days before that I could not make that appointment. Since that time, he has refused to issue another appointment. The board, he says, doesn't want to give me another appointment. Why? I don't know. It appears now that government is for the realtor. Government is of the realtor. Government is by the realtor. Why is the assessment appeals board completely dominated by realtor people? That's outrageous, it's out of order. Out of order. You may say, well, they know the price of things. Yes, but their object is to keep getting the assessments up and up and up because the commissions that they're gonna get become huge and they don't die. When a house becomes 150 years old or older, its assessment rather should come down rather than go up. I'm 92 plus years old. And I have to tell you, I'm collapsing. I'm falling apart. I'm not 20 years old any longer. In 20 years ago, when I was 20, I was everything in the army and so forth and so on. But those days are over. So now, if the assessment is increased, who benefits most by it? Social Security has increased 2%, whereas assessments have increased, well, my assessment increased a number of years back by 167%. Recently, it increased by over 15%. I live 50. 15 or 13 feet away from a railroad. And it runs quite often. You've got Amtrak and you've got freight cars, a number every day. And some of them are a mile long or longer. 
being pulled by six or so, five or six or so engines. If the noise isn't bothering to bother you, and it doesn't bother me that much because I'm deaf in here and I'm probably less than 1% right here. So I live with it. Also, I live with the dust that comes from the cold, empty coal cars. They're loaded with dust. My facility picks up a lot of dust and it's not the best facility. It went from 60,000 and they're telling me it's now 80, over 80,000. If someone was to give me 80,000 for that building, I would be more than happy to get rid of it. It's not worth it. The assessors, having every assessor on the appeals board is ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous. They seem to get people say, well, they know what it's worth. I don't care what it's worth. They think it what it's worth. I know what it's worth. It's worth about probably 60,000 at the very best. Not much more than that. Not 80,000. Okay. I've seen so many houses being destroyed because people don't want to fix them up. Your time is up. Yeah, I know. Mr. Rosenberg, can you please okay. speak with Mr. Fossey? But I think I need an appointment with the assessor. Mr. Rosenberg, will you please speak with Mr. Fossey about and it has um, to the be assessor? Sure. Done. All right. So, Mr. Fossey, do not leave because Mr. Rosenberg is going to speak with you, okay? Thank you, Baldwin. All right. Is there anyone else? Hearing none, I now call the meeting of June 10th, 2021 to a close.